Hi everyone, I'm Suzanne Hume, cleanearthforkids.org. Thank you so much for joining our panel discussion tonight, which is a webinar. We're so glad to see you here. And um, thank you so much, Janice, for being on. And I can see Darren, Leanna, Hannah, and um, Judith are here with us. All right, so let's see, Janice. Would you like to talk about some of our K-12 contests and our community service opportunities? So I'm waiting for Janice to connect. So let's see, John is sharing that screen and I'll just go ahead and start. So um, Janice was gonna let you know about our fun K-12 contests and there is art and music uh, writing and all kinds of presentations and things that you can do. And here's the picture of Janice and others um, from our youth board. Um, and so information on Clean Earth for Kids is about how to enter our contest and volunteer with us. And many people are going to be attending tonight, uh, taking notes for community service opportunities and credit. So um, that is so awesome. So Janice, are you with us now? That is fabulous. Would you yes. like to um, would you like to talk a little bit about contests and community service? Go ahead. Sure. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Janice, and um, I'm here to talk to you about uh, the K through 12 contests and also community service opportunities. Our K through 12 contests consist of creating art doing projects, creating music, writing, presentations, and so much more. You can enter our contest at any time, so find out more about K-12 contests on our contest and community service page on the Clean Art for Kids website. If you are taking notes for community service, remember you need two full pages of notes front to back, plus a summary paragraph with questions you have and examples of some new things you learn. Great, thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for that. Awesome, okay, so um, Leanna, did you have something to share about COVID-19? Um, we have something on the front page of our website. Would you like to talk about that? You're muted right now. Okay, hi, my name is Leanna. Um, i just like to remind you all that obviously COVID-19 information is on the homepage of our website for those of you guys who need it. Um, and speaking of COVID-19, uh, unfortunately, research from Harvard has shown that African-American communities um, are dying at higher rates of, from coronavirus and air pollution as a whole. Um, and obviously there's a connection, not obviously, sorry, but um, there's a connection between air pollution and COVID-19 as we uh, briefly discussed in previous webinars. Um, in terms of respiratory problems, people with respiratory problems um, are more likely to get COVID-19 and obviously, and air pollution is a big attributor to a lot of respiratory problems today. So um, Hannah, could you talk about environmental justice and explain what is happening in these frontline communities? Hi, I'm Hannah Smith. So um, we have so much to talk about in the area of environmental justice. Next week, I will be talking about frontline communities, sacrifice zones, redlining, rollbacks of vital air pollution protections that we need. We learned of a lot from environmental champion, Dr. Mufasa Santiago Ali. Dr. Ali, created the Environmental Justice Office at the EPA, and he was here to talk with us a couple of weeks ago about the environmental justice. Mm -hmm. So important, so important. So Hannah, can you um, tell us what is a frontline community? Yes, Susan, so a frontline community is where People with less resources live on the front lines, excuse me, meaning these people live, live the closest to sources of toxic air pollution. 
So they mm -hmm. live near busy highways, airports, power plants, or factories where other people are benefiting or profiting. But these mm -hmm. people living in frontline communities are the ones who are living and breathing in toxic air pollution. Frontline mm -hmm. communities could also be those living near pesticides who feel the toxic effects first. Dr. Ali has also called these services where people are living so close to pollution, sacrifice zones. Yeah, wow, sacrifice zones. And thank you so much, Hannah, for that. Just to give you some, just to let you know, if you could be a little louder, that would be great because we, you have such important information to share. So um, thank you so much for talking about sacrifice zones and um, and Dr. Um, Ali and what is what is going on with all of that. So um, great. So can you give us a little inf more information, Hannah, about um, what is a sacrifice zone? Yes. So a sacrifice zone is when people are exposed to higher levels of pollution and there is no enforcement or little protection for these people and the factories pollute, the highways pollute, the power plants pollute. And with the terrible rollbacks or undoing a protection from the EPA or Environmental Protection Agency that is supposed to be protecting our air and water, it is even worse now. Less protections for people of color and or those who are Native American people or low-income people don't have the power to stand up and change the problem. These people are living in sacrifice zones, sacrificing their lives because people are burning fossil fuels and continue to dump their talk to toxic waste into water or into the sky. People become sick and have chronic ongoing health problems because of this. Because living next to pollution causes chronic ongoing health problems makes everything go worse. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. Um, next week, we'll learn more about systematic racism and discrimination and uh, the reason that many people of color or low-income people live in sacrifice zones to begin with, where polluters and the people who live there are just supposed to just deal with it because they don't necessarily have place like elsewhere to go. Mm -hmm. uh, we will also talk about redlining, which is very, very important. Um, mm -hmm. Hannah, is there anything else you'd like? No, there isn't. Excited about that conversation next week. So these are really important topics that we're talking about with sacrifice zones and um, systemic racism, redlining, discrimination, pollution. Um, this is very important. Um, and we'll be developing more and more um, environmental justice materials as we um, go forward. And we look forward to um, hearing ideas from, from everyone for sure. Thank you, Hannah and Leanna, for that important information. Now, you may or may not know that beaches all along the San Diego County in California have reopened or will be reopening soon. They have been closed because of the COVID-19 in an attempt to keep people from spreading the virus. Now we have a new pro problem on the Southern California, uh, California off the West Coast, red tide. As of right now, the shore and sand is open, but the beach is not due to cross-border border pollution, which is causing red tide. This is calling for emergency action from the U.S. and Mexico. So have any of you seen red tide, or could you tell us about red tide? Um, I could talk a little bit about red tide. As um, I but previously, before moving to California, I used to live in Florida, and in 2018, we just had a really big um, red tide on the east coast of Florida and I used to live right next to the beach so I firsthand saw the damaging effects and toxicity that uh, red tide consists of. Um, so I'll just briefly discuss it as I will be discussing it a little bit later in my presentation as it connects to a lot of problems, environmental problems we are facing as well. Um, but to summarize it, red tide is the accumulation, uh, it's, it's 
of algae, but not necessarily your typical algae blooms, but, are, uh, but this is a different type of algal bloom as it feeds off the nut nutrients from runoffs, uh, rather that's from um, agricultural runoff or industrial runoff. And typically that runoff uh, consists of a lot of nutrients such as phosphates. And this process called phosphorification happens where it basically the algae gets to eat all those nutrients and it accumulates and accumulates and uh, these toxins are brought out and that causes red tide during the day and in some circumstances bioluminescence um, at night, which is what you guys, what is uh, being shown in the news lately in San Diego and Imperial County and so forth. Yes, and Oceanside as and well. Oceanside as I, well, yes. I was so, I was so, I, I couldn't believe it. It was like looking at, it was different than looking at the Mississippi River. I'm from Missouri, so I'm used to looking at a rivers with muddy bottoms, but this is different. It looks like dark copper color um, added with some maroon in it. It is just crazy. Our, our ocean <laughs> here in um, Oceanside, California, when I look out, usually, you know, I see blue water and it is anything but blue. So it's, um, I was, very, very distressed about what has happened and how this has occurred. And Leanna, yes, living with your experience living in Florida, you have seen this. So I'm, I'm eager to hear more. Yeah, I'll definitely um, discuss it and its connection to uh, one of the biggest topics for tonight, which are pesticides. Um, so there's definitely a connection between uh, herbicides, pesticides, sexicides, and uh, red tide as well. Yes. Thank you, Leanna, for teaching us about red tide. I would like everyone to see Judith's art. Judith, your artwork says that mercury hurts brains, and you've drawn a picture of a coal power plant with smoke coming out of it, emitting mercury. You also have a picture of a fish because mercury can get digested by fish, and then if we consume it, it becomes toxic for us to eat. Obviously, your art is telling us that this rollback is a very bad thing, but can you please explain, Max, and why it's heartbreaking that this is being rolled back? That stands for Mercury and Air Toxic Standards. This, this is Judith, I'm going to stop you real quick. Uh, um, this is just amazing art. I mean, wow, right? So, so absolutely amazing and important. Um, I want to hear, we all want to hear what you have to say. Um, your mic needs to be a lot louder, just to let you know. Okay. Um, I'll start again. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Janice. So, Matt stands for Mercury and Air Toxic Standards. This, is, this important protection for our air and water has been rolled back and is no longer in place. This is tragic because mercury is a neurotoxin and it hurts kids' brains. Mercury, a highly powerful neurotoxin, a poison, is placed into our air when burning coal and oil. The purpose of MAT environmental protection was to protect children and communities from mercury and other air toxics coming from burning fossil fuels at power plants. Maths was so important because it prevented the causes of breathing problems, heart diseases, cancer, and other illnesses. Finally, in 2012, after decades, power up okay we lost judith for a second there okay i think she muted herself because an alarm is going on or something in her house okay so i'm going to recap for you real quick judith and then have you come back on so judith is talking about mats and it's a little harder to hear her tonight um so um she's going to speak as loudly as she can she's talking about mats which is the mercury and toxic standards protections that have been rolled back by the 
Trump administration's uh, EPA. Um, so, all right. And um, she talked about this and she's going to talk about this again next week. So very important. Thank you so much for, for doing that and, and sharing that with us. So I, uh, Janice, did you have something to share? That sounds really important. Does anyone know how many lives each year it saved? Yes, um, the mercury and air toxic standard is set to save up to 11,000 lives along with $90 billion each year. Judith, we look forward to you talking to us next week more about mercury and MATS. Again, MATS stands for Mercury and Toxic Substances Protections. So we all like to learn more about this important protection that has been taken away by the EPA, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, that overviews our country and is supposed to be protecting us. The problem is the person in charge of the EPA, not all of the wonderful, hardworking people employed at the EPA. We need to recognize the important work that all of the people at the EPA on the federal level for our country and for our state. People are working hard every day to help. The problem is that a person named Andrew Wheeler, who was a lobbyist, worked for the coal industry and is now in charge of the protections for our country. I agree with Judith. We must bring the mats roll back to the public. People have the right to know. I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation. Also, we will be talking about PFAs and harmful chemicals in the water and what we can do. A tragic but inspiring story has been made into a movie. Have you seen the movie Dark Waters with Mark Ruffalo? It's PG-13. This movie is about a specific type of PFAs called PFO, PFOA. The company 3M told DuPont not to dump this chemical into the water, but people did it anyway. Hundreds and thousands of pounds of toxic PFOA water in, got into the water. They knew PFOA was a toxic for over 40 years because 3M and DuPont had been conducting secret scientific studies. So in fact, they did study they did studies of factory workers and found elevated level levels of PFOA in the workers' blood, and they did not report this to the EPA. They tested children of pregnant employees in their Teflon division. Tef Teflon is a nonstick chemical coating that goes on pans when you are cooking and so that the food does not stick to the pan. There's more about these important stories that we will share. In the meantime, you may want to check out the movie Dark Waters by Mark Ruffalo. Remember, it's PG-13. Important. I'm excited to um, have everybody see this, definitely. So I have to say uh, that we all are preparing for tomorrow. We have a really big meeting with the County of San Diego to try to ban some toxic pesticides. And we have a lot of things that we would like to cover. So um, we're going to do our best here um, to talk about uh, many of these pesticides that we would like banned and prepare for our meeting um, tomorrow. So as you guys know, Darren is the lead for Team 5 Toxic Pesticides and Chemicals. And so she's going to do a slideshow for us, and I'm sure we'll have many questions for her. And then each of our youth board have a specific pesticide that they are working to ban in the county of San Diego. So I'll give you just a second of um, information. So um, tomorrow we're going to be talking about glyphosate um, with glyphosate. I always say it, glyphosate, it's glyphosate, glyphosate. Okay, we are going to be talking with the county office, or I'm sorry, the um, the county of San Diego tomorrow about banning this and also an IPM. An IPM is an integrated pest management plan. And Darren's gonna talk with you about that. 
And I'll just say our preference is not to use any synthetic pesticides. Synthetic is man-made as Darren will um, review with you. And so, and to just have it uh, be organic and regenerative farming. Um, anyway, so we've got some things that we are learning about and um, we're very concerned about several of the things being used on leased lands here in San Diego. So it may not be used in a park, but if it's used in a community and they are leasing the land from San Diego um, and it's you know near homes and near people, wildlife gonna get into our water, then we're very concerned. So we will go through these. Um, we will go through these pesticides and um, give you some information and we're excited to answer questions. And um, okay, Darren, take it away. All right, thank you, Suzanne. I uh, just need to share my screen really quickly and we can get started. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to go over just before we get into the IPM is um, the different classifications for carcinogens. Um, so this may be a little bit hard to understand at first, but basically they're categorized by the level of carcinogenic effects for humans based on the likelihood that it is carcinogenic. So um, group one would be the most and then group four would be the least. Um, so this chart is helpful in explaining the specifics and also what uh, type of things would fall under each group. Okay. So uh, can I can we go back to that for just one second, Darren? Yeah. So this is going to help us. This org that organizing page right here. This, as Darren said, this is going to help us so much. So when we talk about a one, right? We have in our mind red alert, and then two A, um, two B, three and four. So this is so huge and um, just really important. So thank you again so much. So I, I myself need to look back and remember this as we are speaking because we're gonna talk about um, some toxic pesticides and we wanna think about what level they are and learn more. So we're really prepared for tomorrow. Our meeting with San Diego County um, here in California is tomorrow our time from 3.30 to 4.30 and then we will be following up with them. So excited to work with everyone uh, to help the world be much better. All right, so a synthetic pesticide, like Suzanne said, is man-made. Um, it's designed to target a specific pests. So by default, that means that it shouldn't harm other organism, organisms in the area. And they also are designed to work faster than organic pesticides. However, a lot of them uh, are pretty bad for us. They're carcinogenic, mutagenic, which means they can cause genetic mutation or teratinogenic which means um, it targets or it creates malformation in an embryo. Um, so the other uh, type of pesticide there is is organic. Um, and that's there's a list on the USDA. I think that's mostly classified by what pesticides organic farmers are allowed to use. Um, but they're often just as effective. They just take maybe a little bit longer to work and they affect humans to a lesser extent. So as we go through this, um, we just want to call attention to this, that there is a difference. And if we are going to use pesticides, there is an obvious winner. <laughs> Obviously, right, Darren. You're like, there's an obvious, like, no synthetic pesticides, please. Let's have it be natural and organic. Um, or, you know, use the great strategies that, um, that we can talk about you know, um, bring in some ladybugs and um, be creative in what you plant and do and continue, Darren, you're doing awesome. Okay, so just basically going over what the IPM essentially talks about. It's a pretty short document, only 11 pages if you're interested, but um, if you don't have the time or you don't care to look at it in further detail, I'm just going to explain it to you. Um, in like a shorter amount of time. So um, there's, it's a tiered approach to pest management. So if the first tier doesn't work, then you go to the second and so forth, so on. 
Um, so the first way to manage pests in Oceanside is going to be cultural, mechanical, and biological. So for cultural, it would be modifying plant care practices, like changing the frequency of irrigation or fertilization, or changing how much or how the length of what you leave when you trim lawns or mow lawns, things like that. Secondly, there's manual labor or using machinery to remove pets, pests like traps could be an example of machinery there. Um, and that's part of the mechanical aspect. And then for biological, oh wait, no, secondly, or thirdly, um, mostly used in indoors is altering temperature, light, or humidity to um, make it an unideal habitat for pests so that they hopefully will leave. And then lastly, uh, the biological aspect is introducing beneficial organisms, beneficial organisms. And these are basically organisms that take care of the, the problem themselves. These include- Like ladybugs, pathogens. right? Our yeah. favorite example is ladybugs because everybody likes ladybugs, right? Yeah. <laughs> so basically in general terms, this could include pathogens, parasites, predators, competitive species, herbivores, and antagonistic organisms. So basically anything that will reduce population or drive them away. Um, second, secondly, if none of these are working, then Oceanside will continue on to organic pesticides, and then they continue to get more toxic as you move down the list. Mm -hmm. um, least toxic, but what they mean by that is that there are no known likely or probable carcinogens, reproductive toxicants, or endocrine, uh, endocrine disruptors. Um, also, it has a soil half-life of 30 days or less, so it doesn't stay in the soil for very long, and it's not toxic to wildlife or domestic animals, and this includes bees. So these are the better synthetic pesticides, and this is also defined as the EPA toxicity level of three. Um, so it kind of works like the, the other scale that we were looking at earlier, where the larger the number, the least toxic it is. And then once you get to one, it's the most toxic. Um, some other good things to know about the IPM before we get into its drawbacks is that um, <laughs> when using the toxic pesticides, um, there will be public notice. So people know not to be there and like when they can come back. And also there'll be avoiding areas where people gather like park benches and tables and things like that. And also they're required to keep detailed information on record for when and where and how much they use of a pesticide. So you can keep track of that and keep them accountable. So now there are some downsides. <laughs> um, the first one is that the highest level of authority or the lowest level of authority required to approve the use of um, a synthetic pesticide is a maintenance supervisor. And basically these are the people who oversee workers. So it's not very high up in the, the hierarchy of authority and they may not be educated about the gravity of toxic pesticides and may favor fast results over toxicity. Um, so we would like the IPM to require someone higher up to approve the use of pesticides. Right. Are you talking someone that works, um, you know, someone that works in the city um, versus someone that is doing the work that it may be just more convenient for them to say, oh, well, this other, um, I tried to, um, I tried to use um, these other methods and it didn't work. So I'm just going to, you know, spray toxic stuff on it. Um, so with the maintenance supervisor, hopefully people wouldn't do that because through the IPM, they're supposed to document what they use and what's effective, and it's supposed to be a plan, right? So integrative pest management plan, but we are concerned that there's not enough oversight on this. So I absolutely agree with Darren on this, talking about we, um, and this passed in Oceanside, and we wanted it to be worded a little bit differently. So when we go forward with the County of San Diego, with the IPM helping them put together something that we're really proud and excited about, um, granted we wish they didn't, wouldn't use anything um, bad or, or, or whatever that's even 2A probable carcinogenic, but um, as we go forward, these are the kinds of things that we're looking at and thinking about. 
So when they prevent, present us with something, then we say, okay, well, who is signing off on that? And how is it being checked? And the other thing is we want this, we want to get an IPM for Vista in California. We want to get this happening in all cities in Missouri and, you know, all different um, cities in Missouri and, and everywhere, right? Just as we're trying to ban chlorpyrifos, um, a toxic pesticide that hurts the brains of kids in all 50 states, because it's just banned here and shortly will be banned in New York and in um, Hawaii, the same thing. We want to make sure what we're doing, we can share with everyone. And so we have youth everywhere talking about the best strategies and we can make this happen and also make sure that we don't have toxic pesticides at our schools. Okay, so yes, drawbacks to the Oceanside's IPM. Please continue. Okay, so um, as I briefly went over before, they are allowing um, toxic pesticides to be used um, as a last resort, which is never a good thing. We'd prefer the IPM to stop at the organic and less toxic pesticides, especially since toxic pesticides can cause damage to reproductive endocrine and central nervous system. So it uh, affects human health in a very severe way. And um, we don't think it should ever be used no matter how irritating the pests may be. Um, so yeah. And we'll figure it out, right? We'll find another way as people have done. Okay, so now I'd like to start talking about um, specific pesticides that we should be banning in San Diego County um, in light of the meeting tomorrow. So the first one that I want to talk about is diazinon, which is um, an insecticide. Um, it is part of the organophosphate group of insecticides and pesticides. Um, this is under control in insects and crops and is also used to make ear tags for cattle. And the way it works is that it affects the chemicals that are used to make the CNS or central nervous system uh, function smoothly. So then um, it leads to a loss of control over the nervous system as a whole and it leads to the death of the insect. So humans uh, are indirectly affected by this or can be indirectly exposed to um, this insecticide through the produce it will as it's uh, used to treat um, a lot of agricultural crops that we eat, um, people can find it on their food. They can also inhale it or come into contact with it through their skin. Um, the last two are typically found in agricultural workers or through pesticide drift. Um, and it also affects our nervous system. Um, it works the same way as it does on insects. It targets chemicals and is meant to damage the central nervous system. And it also has neurotoxic effects, is an endocrine disruptor, and it can lead to reproductive and developmental damage and effects um, for mothers and their children. So with low levels of exposure, they all affect the nervous system, but the symptoms that you may notice are include watery eyes, runny nose, loss of appetite, coughing, urination, stomach pain, and so on and so forth. Um, but with a prolonged exposure or high level of exposure, it can lead to more severe symptoms like tremors, muscle spasms or muscle stiffness, uh, muscle weakness, paralysis, rapid heart rate, difficulty breathing, seizures, convulsions, and comas. Um, it also affects animals in a profound way. Um, it's found that it can have damage to the pancreas and also produce reproductive and developmental effects. Um, it also is highly toxic to birds and most insects, including bees, which, as you know, bees are um, very essential to our well being as well as the well being of the planet. So, it's something we should look out for. Um, it's currently being used on the county of San Diego on land leased for agricultural use, like Suzanne was talking about earlier. Um, but right now it's banned in 32 countries, including Argentina, India, 27 European, European Union countries, Palestine, and the United Kingdom. So um, it's not a novel idea that this is a bad 
um, insecticide that is having a profound effect on our citizens. So yeah. Thank you so much for yeah. that. That is going to help us so much tomorrow because we're going to be able to figure out, you know, which ones that we really need to press for. Thank you so much. Um, Liana, would you like to share? Of course, let me just pull up my slides really quick. Thank you. So you are also going to talk about an organophosphate. So yes. organophosphates are very toxic. So thank you so much. And this is also being used in um, San Diego County on leased lands. And so um, we want to talk with San Diego County about not allowing this. And so this is very important. Yes, okay. So um, the insecticide I'm gonna be talking about today is acephate. Um, and I have bees, which you'll understand why later. Um, mm -hmm. Quick overview, I'm just gonna talk about what is it, why is it toxic, connections to our lives, and why it must go. Okay, thank you. So um, an acephate uh, is an organic organophosphate insecticide, uh, and it is used on food crops, citrus trees, and as a seed treatment, even on golf courses, and in a commercial and institutional facilities. Mm -hmm. So a few examples of um, some food crops, it might be used on our potatoes, um, it also can be used on roses, um, turf, and forestry, so a lot of different uh, uses, and uh, mainly agricultural, of course. But um, that's stuff, stuff, stuff we are consuming, stuff we are um, seeing, buying, and so forth. So how is it harmful? So uh, I like to divide into three different categories, human health, ecological effects, and environmental effects. So in terms of uh, human health, it is a known neurotoxin. It mm -hmm. is, uh, has harmful reproductive effects. It's a fetal toxin, which is fatal to um, fetals uh, and fetuses, sorry, not fetals. Uh, <laughs> It is uh, very toxic to the fetus and can kill fetuses. It's also toxic to organs. Um, it, as uh, Darren mentioned, the central nervous system, uh, gastrointestinal um, system, or respiratory systems, all very, very, very important systems in our bodies. Um, mm -hmm. It's also a known irritant and sensitizer, so it can make your eyes itchy, uh, watery, um, any like your nose, anything like that. Um, it is also a potential uh, carcinogen. It would probably be around 2A or 2B on that chart Darren um, uh, mentioned earlier. And it's like a lethal dose, uh, lethal concentration of 50. So uh, it would kill about half of the experimental animals exposed to it for a set period of time, which is just horrible thinking about it. This was tested um, uh, by Cornell uh, back in the 90s. Um, on dogs specifically. So oh. all the stuff I'm talking about the human health is that it was uh, test, they, they had a test with dogs. It oh. was terrible. Dogs that were exposed to it, essentially. Terrible, terrible stuff. Um, so speaking of animals and such, ecological effects, uh, it's very toxic to birds. It can impact their behavior, uh, mm -hmm. their breeding behavior, and has mortality rates, of course. It's also toxic to aquatic organisms, uh, mm -hmm. however, it is not as um, common because uh, this type of um, insecticide is water soluble. So it, um, it doesn't necessarily have a bioaccumulation rate. It will, it's it easier, it more easily um, will dilute in water per se. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also very toxic to bees, which I have throughout the presentation, like little mm -hmm. uh, bees, uh, have, has the highest mortality rate for insects, birds, all organisms. Um, <laughs> causes a lot of improper functions, whether it's breeding, the behavior. Uh, it has a very low lethal dose, which means very uh, uh, little goes a long way to um, harming these bees. And bees obviously are pollinators. They're very important to our ecosystems and um, agriculture overall. And then finally, environmental effects. Um, so in the environment, acephate breaks down with a few days to degradation products, um, including this uh, more toxic organophosphate. So if you think this is toxic, it can degrade into an even more to toxic version of itself, Wow, uh, which is which is terrible for um, the soil and um, and can potentially um, show up in leachate, which is uh, what can go into groundwater potentially. Mm -hmm. It also emits toxic fumes of 
phosphorus, nitrogen, and sulfur oxides, which you don't ever want accumulating in the atmosphere or just in our air that we're breathing overall. We already have enough uh, potential and known um, causes that create those fumes. Uh, we don't need to add any more through pesticides. Uh, so this happens when it's heated to decomposition, which is very probable and given the circumstances it is used in. Uh, also symptoms of exposure to asphate include slight irritation of eyes and skin. As I mentioned earlier, it is a known irritant and sensitizer. So um, knowing all this harmful stuff about uh, not only this insecticide, but pesticides overall, uh, there's a lot of connection we can actually make uh, to it. While this specific um, insecticide is not necessarily known to um, flourish in runoff as it is uh, water soluble and there's a lot of other components to it. Uh, most pesticides actually uh, do uh, accumulate in runoff. So as I mentioned earlier with red tides, red tides and pesticides kind of go hand in hand. Um, so nutri nutrient pollution uh, that fuels algal blooms comes from a lot of sources, whether it's leaky septic tanks, sewage infrastructure, storm water specifically, that's a really large one in um, the East Coast and so forth. But uh, a lot of it comes from the runoff from agricultural and landscape and fertilizers, as well as pesticides. Um, so when, the wa when it rains or any type of other water source comes um, in contact with these fertilizers and pesticides, these fertilizers and pesticides adhere to the water source and it runs off into nearby um, oceans, lakes, uh, watersheds, you name it. And the algal and the algae um, in the water already, that's food to them. So they accumulate at a faster rate and they cause these really uh, bad uh, red tides, which are ex ex basically um, algal blooms to a whole nother level. And these red tides can actually be very, very dangerous. Um, they can cause respiratory, skin, and eye irritation. Um, and this is also especially dangerous during COVID-19. As you know, there's a connection to those with already pre-existing respiratory problems. And if we have something like red tide going on, making people um, more uh, inclined to get these respiratory problems and irritations, we are making them more susceptible to things like COVID-19 and any future viruses and so forth. Um, so while it might look pretty at night, the bioluminescence <laughs> blue, it's mm -hmm. actually, in fact, uh, really dangerous and toxic. not good, not only for human health, yeah, it's toxic, uh, not only for our human health, but also marine life, because within these um, red tides, these brevitoxins are produced, and these can kill fish, um, you name it, essentially, anywhere in the vicinity, that marine life is severely um, impacted. Uh, when I was in Florida and I saw the, I went sort of near the beach, I couldn't go too near. Um, I could just feel the top, like you could just smell it in the air. My eyes started watering instantly. And on the, on the, um, the coast, all you could see were dead fish on the sand. It was really, oh. really sad. It was a terrible sight to see, not only because not only are we um, in danger, also marine life is. So this is something important to realize when we uh, get out pesticides, we're not just getting it out of our human health and the uh, health of um, animals and insects, but we're also um, lessening the chances of things like red tides uh, to occur. So essentially, pesticides, as we know, must go. Why? Harmful to human health. As we stated earlier, our, a bunch of our um, core systems are impacted. It's also a neurotoxin. Uh, it's harmful to our environment and ecological systems. And the biggest uh, reason I think they must go is because we have alternatives. Uh, organic farming with organic pesticides, regenerative farming, and alternatives um, for things such as like herbicides. There's uh, solarization, which is something I worked on previously before. And it's a great alternative to getting rid of um, certain things like invasive uh, plants and stuff, which are a little bit trickier and herbicides and pesticides are the go-to for those. However, those are obviously dangerous as they um, can go towards watersheds, as I mentioned earlier. So we have the alternatives. And we know they're uh, harmful. They're banned in like 32 countries, including China, even China banned it. We should mm -hmm. know that this is, this is a no-go. That's a no-go. And uh, people can see your work on solarization and the important work that you did um, to um 
you know, your tarping work uh, to help rid the invasive sea lavender, Algerian sea lavender, right? Yeah, yeah. okay, and that's on our website. Um, and so she used dark tarps. We talk about that a minute? Oh, yeah, so um, I previously worked on a um, research opportunity uh, through this other organization, and essentially uh, there was this invasive sea, Algerian sea lavender plant which uh, was taking over the native uh, plant species uh, in the surrounding lagoon. And what they would uh, try to use typically is an herbicide. And while the herbicide would work, it, would grow the, it wouldn't necessarily cause the plant to decompose and go away. It would only deter growth. And then once it was like uh, gone for, I don't know, maybe say a month or two, it would grow instantly back. And so it wasn't a long-term solution. It wasn't an effective solution. And obviously it could also harm the nearby lagoon, which, was, uh, which would counteract their entire uh, mission statement, essentially. So one thing that we looked into was solarization, which is the use of, um, sadly, plastic tarp. However- um, <laughs> But you reuse them. You reuse uh, these reuse black them. tarps to get rid of, and you didn't have to use all the pesticides. So that yeah, was so just amazing. It, yeah, I heated, uh, when you take the tarp over these plant species um, for about four months at a time, the heat uh, gets, it goes through the tarp and gets stuck within the tarp. And it, it's basically this giant, um, I guess, oven for these invasive species. However, the temperature changes between the invasive and the native species make sure that native species could grow and um, thrive under these conditions while the invasive species was killed. You no know, herbicides had to be used and it was a long-term effective solution because the decomposition of these plants would occur and it means that these, uh, this invasive species would necessarily be gone from that area or at least very close to it with little, like literally no herbicides or pesticides. So there is evidence and research out there of alternate solutions. So I think it's, it's, it's a big reason as why we should get rid of pesticides because we have these solutions. Yeah, for sure. I was so excited about that when I learned about that. And tomorrow you will be sharing your expertise again with the um, County of San Diego. I'm so proud to have you guys serving on these important um, boards with the county and you should feel just really uh, proud of yourselves and um, all the important work that you're doing, applying for grants um, from the state. Um, and all of the important things that you're doing, you're just, you're all superstars and so amazing and such nice people too. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Now, um, Janice, who had to step off for a moment, was going to talk about a fungicide. Um, let's see, um, Liana, I know you just shared, would you like to share and talk a little bit about this um, fungicide? <laughs> no okay <laughs> no I'm sorry okay yeah okay so here you go all right okay go for it you're muted she's still muted okay so I'm gonna go ahead and start and she can jump in so okay so we here is um obviously the map of where um this organophosphate I'm sorry organ this organophosphate uh, pesticide, which is um, a fungicide. And, and anyway, uh, so we can all work together on how to pronounce this. Uh, this is what Janice is going to be sharing with the county tomorrow. Anyway, and talk about this. And we know that um, it is banned in three countries, Colombia, Palestine, um, Saudi Arabia, and it's toxic to humans. And it's obviously used on agricultural crops like we've been talking about on leased lands in San Diego County in California. And it's also used on Christmas trees. This made me very sad. Um, and of course- Yes, it is or it's an ornamental um, uh, pesticide. As like you said, it is used on Christmas trees. It's used on lawns, various agricultural, um, and things also like golf courses again, and like wood treatments which uh, you would not think wood treatments would necessarily have pesticides, but they do. Um, as well as you were mentioning how it is damaged to human health. It is a uh, likely carcinogen. So I would rate that probably at a 2A again, um, depending on the, uh, based off research. Uh, it does have toxic reproductive effects. 
It is a known neurotoxin. It has uh, kidney and liver damage, and it is, again, a sensitizer and um, irritant. Uh, it is also, the one interesting thing about this is that there are known detectants of, in uh, groundwater, which groundwater uh, connects to our water sources. So this is something that you might um, consider to uh, probably help things like red tide flourish as it is, uh, has a direct connection to groundwater. And it is also a, um, a part of leachate, which is, again, what it brings down, uh, goes to the soil, goes into our water systems, and which is, which is not good at all. It is also known, because its ability to go into groundwater and water systems is known a toxic, as a known toxic um, thing to fish and aquatic organisms. Uh, yeah, and, and, and so I'm imagining this is, um, you know, Janice is uh, team four, water is life. And so um, it's very important to her to get this and other uh, toxic pesticides banned. And I can only imagine our consultant, Dr. Emily Catalan right now, um, thinking about how excited she is to, to uh, be there tomorrow with the county um, on that team to look at what we can uh, get banned and make people healthier. So I'm sure that she is definitely um, so happy that Janice has brought this forward and that Juliana are talking about this as well and that Darren has done such a phenomenal job of, of leading this. So, so hats off to you. So fantastic job team. You guys are just so absolutely amazing. Okay, so Hannah, um, Hannah, um, so would you like to share and talk about bees. So um, I know that um, we had talked about neonicotinoids, and would you like to talk about why you would like pesticides that harm bees to be banned? Yes, so I would like, so as to say what, or said what Suzanne said, so neonicotinoids, Sorry, I can't. It's pronounce. so hard to say, isn't it though? Neon nicotinoid. Neon yeah. Nicotinoid. Neon nicotinoid. Um, it's basically toxic and very harmful to animals because bees pollinate our our trees, our flowers that gives us oxygen with the trees, and then with out the bees and other animals in our world, in our world, um, we would probably not have enough, we wouldn't have enough like oxygen or anything to breathe. Like, right, to pollinate our, to pollinate things and also, you know, for our food, right? So, mm -hmm. um, because we need our pollinators and so these neonicotinoids so hard to say. Um, we need to talk about that because they're currently being used in San Diego, California on leased lands. And so we can um, talk about this uh, tomorrow. So as you can see on your screen, um, unless you've called in, you can see how neonicotinoids can contaminate the entire ecosystem through contaminated dust um, and the coated seeds affect birds invertebrate toxicity, treated plants, and food web distributions. And so you can look at that, and for all of our people that are um, either studying chemistry or chemists, I'm sure this is um, very important to you. And the pesticide that Liana was talking about earlier, um, you know, that affects our bees. And by the way, pesticide is a large like umbrella term. And so under that, of course, we've got insecticides, etc. But if you say pesticide, you also mean obviously insecticide. So you're always safe if you say pesticide. You don't have to say herbicide, meaning for, you know, the plants or insecticide, meaning targeting the insects because um, pesticides disrupt the entire ecosystem. So um, for sure. So you guys, um, so amazing. So uh, Liana, tonight I was wanting to know, do you have, would you like to talk about what um, the other, it's an insect bee killer currently used on San Diego County uh, leased lands 
Um, and I know Alice, who is listening tonight and taking notes. Hi, Alice. Um, so this pesticide um, we had talked about um, you using as well. So I don't know if Leanne is going to be on to be able to share this, but this is another one that we are wanting um, to ban. So it looks like it's bifenthrin. So, and um, it obviously uh, kills bees and is currently being used. So we will talk about that and others. So um, thank you guys so much for, for being on. Um, I'd love to hear from our artist, Judith. So Judith, um, I, wanna, I wanna say to you again, hats off about the important work that you have done um, through your art um, to bring awareness about that rollback the mats rollback, Mercury and Air Toxic Substance um, Act. And I'd like to, to find out, because people are interested and want to know. So can you tell us a little bit about um, what you hope your art will accomplish? I hope that um, it could... Um, You're muted right now. So, so yes. So, um, Judith, you hope to help the world, right? In your important art and bring um, awareness to all of us um, about the important things that we need to be doing. And your art is so powerful and um, beautiful. I'm just so excited about it. So, can you tell us what inspires you, Judith, to do the art? Um, yes. Um, I've seen many. But, like children all over the world like suffering and it's really hurts it's really heartbreaking and really tragic and I want to like spread awareness to people around the world of, like of these occurrings and happenings and I just want to like make a difference like through my words and like help like speak like through my art like have a voice through my art that's what I'm trying to say Oh yeah, for sure. And you, yes, absolutely. And so, and Kevin writes poetry and we welcome you all to, um, all K-12 students to enter our contest. Um, it's on our homepage and our um, high school students are doing community service. They turn in two pages of notes. They take a picture of those notes and they um, email it to me. I check it. Um, and uh, it's important to be able to give students these opportunities to be able to learn about what is happening and be able to advocate for themselves and others. So Darren, can I ask you, can you tell me what inspires you to do the important work that you're doing? I mean, putting together all of these slides, spending so much time pulling all of these things together, what inspires you and what do you hope to accomplish? Well, for me, I... I already like to do research um, before I started working at Phoenix for Kids.org, so it was a good combination of um, doing what I can to help combat the climate crisis and also um, doing things that I like to do already. So I hope to provide helpful information for people who may have been curious or may have just stumbled across it and are now finding this very important or interesting information. And I also hope to inspire people to find out things for themselves and not just take things uh, that other people say at face value and um, make sure that they're getting the right information and also inspire people to um, create change. Yes, and we are so grateful for you. I just, Oh goodness, we are all so grateful for all of your important research and your important work and um, and all of that for sure. So Hannah, can you tell us about what inspires you to do the work that you do and how you got started? Hi, yes. Uh, so the work that inspired me to do this was just about seeing all over social media, some kids posting about wanting to help the earth um and then i was like huh that's interesting <laughs> like everyone's trying to help out the 
world and I wanted to see what I could do. So I got help started cleanearthforkids.org with Suzanne and I like, and we've gotten like so many great stuff done. Um, we've gotten two no idling resolutions passed at Oceanside Unified School District and Vista Unified School District. And I'd hope to, in the future, to get like every schools and probably the county and other places to get people to not idle because one minute of idling has more carbon monoxide than three packs of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And you want to work for clean air and remind yeah. people to turn off their engines. So fantastic. So thank you guys so much. Oh, Liana, I don't know if you, I don't see you right now because I'm in a different view. Let's see. Yeah. So, um, so I will just fill in for, for Liana for just a second. I know Liana has done a lot of um, very important work. Um, prior to coming to cleanearthforkids.org. As we said, she worked on the tarping project to show that you can use alternatives to pesticides. Um, and she also led a, uh, a sit-in in, in VISTA um, to bring awareness to climate change and what we need to do and take climate action. So we have our six um, our six teams right behind my head. So I'm here, so everybody is welcome to um, join the team and learn more. So thank you guys so much, and we look forward to seeing you next week. And next week, we're gonna talk a lot about PFAs and Dark Waters um, movie uh, that you can check out and see. Um, so we're gonna be talking about that. We'll check in with you and let you know how it goes tomorrow. So excited for Darren and, and all of us uh, for tomorrow, really big meeting, so important. Um, we're also going to talk more next week about glyphosate and um, you know our successes that we've had in banning things like this. And also look at an app that you can use to figure out if your lotion or products you use, makeup, um, if they are toxic. And so there's a code you can scan things in and it hooks to a database and all of that through EWG, which is super important. So thanks again, everybody. So I'm going to stay on. Um, the call and if anybody um, that is with us would like to stay on um, and uh, that has attended tonight and would like to stay on and ask any questions or give us some ideas about um, things we might do with the county, um, et cetera, then um, let us know. All right, if not, then we'll see you here next week, um, Thursday at 5.30 Pacific Standard Time. Thank you again and good night from cleanearthforkids.org. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you. You're fabulous.